Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another in-depth review. I heard suspicious rumblings about playing as Tim Allen in this video game, thanks to some members on my Discord server. And needless to say, I could not pass up the opportunity. This marks my first time playing a game for the sake of reviewing it. Hopefully this will not become a habit, am I right? In fact, I doubt it. Anyways, let's begin as I attempt to deliver a neutral critique of Home Improvement Power Tool Pursuit. I can't begin to describe the amount of requests I've received to review the Home Improvement sitcom, but I'm afraid that won't happen for a long time. Even still, I feel that some background information on the show is warranted. As hinted at before, Home Improvement was a television sitcom that ran from 1991 to 1999. Needless to say, the show was a hit with American audiences, and it held a significant amount of ratings while the show aired. Some look back on it very fondly while others seem to appreciate it, but highlight the dated elements that make home improvement come off as somewhat cringeworthy to a 2018 audience. The premise involves the typical situational comedy with families in the 1990s, but there is a twist. There's a television show inside of Home Improvement called Tool Time, where Tim Taylor and Al Borland show off their handyman skills with a tutorial-based motive, and the comedy comes from how they ruin everything for themselves. You want to set your laminate securely on your shimmies front and back? I don't know, I still find the show charming. This tower has been leaning for over 800 years and it hasn't fallen over. Kind of reminds me of my mother-in-law. <laughs> That's what the television show is all about. As for Power Tool Pursuit, there's little information regarding the game's development, which means it's time to dive straight in. Wait, 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 wait. One more detail. One more detail. I will be often calling this game Home Improvement SNES for convenience. I'm just letting you know. And without further ado, this is Home Improvement Power Tool Pursuit for the SNES. We begin by viewing an episode of Tool Time, and the situation is what you would expect. However, Tim realizes that he left some important tools in another television set, so he heads over and- What the heck? As you can see, the search for Tim's toolbox in the television studio complex gives the developers that opportunity to put Tim Allen in whatever the heck they want. If you're craving to discover more about the lore of Tool Time, you're not gonna find it here. The plot ends as soon as the introductory cutscene concludes. Thankfully, you'll be able to mash through the text in the beginning, which is appreciated. If you choose to watch the cutscene, as you really should if it's your first playthrough, the text continues itself at a decent rate. This is certainly no N64 Ocarina of Time. I appreciate the decency in which the cutscene was executed, but as I've already said, Home Improvement SNES doesn't care about anything except for its gameplay. But if you're still hoping for more plot analysis from your friendly neighborhood IKG, I have tragic news. Not even the instruction booklet will fulfill your hopes. That's right, I did not edit this photo. This is the contents of the instruction book! Okay, that's pretty humorous of the developers. Let's just hope their game is up to snuff, then. Alright, so, the stage lights in the levels remind the player that they're exploring a different set in the studio complex, which admittedly is a nice touch. Folks, let me be completely transparent. I'm not expecting this game to be Professor Layton levels of quality. What I am curious about, though, is if Home Improvement SNES will be as flawed as I anticipate after a neutral critique of the game is completed. This is a platformer with explorative elements, as the goal is to retrieve hidden toolboxes before time runs out. If you stay still for a while, the game will actually guide you to the general direction of another crate, which again, I appreciate. With that said, the levels themselves aren't as large as they may seem, though a decent mix of horizontal and vertical platforming is present. Sonic the Hedgehog is often credited and criticized for using the ring system as a means of dealing with the flaws of fast-paced gameplay, in which Sonic can collect tons of rings, but as long as he has one, he will always be safe from death. Home Improvement SNES uses this exact same system. However, the bolts go in all sorts of directions, and this game is a lot more conservative with the amount of trinkets you can recollect far less than Sonic the Hedgehog. 
However, this health system doesn't leave much of a stain on the game's quality. Even still, prepare for stupid design elements in 3, 2, 1... Tim Allen's sprite isn't particularly large, but it takes up way too much of the screen, and it's very hard to see when things are coming your way. This is because the camera is zoomed in too much. Hazards are littered throughout the levels, and there's practically no solution to fixing this other than slowing down. And trust me, more on that later. Oh, and good luck turning on a hill while running. <laughs> How is this real? My least favorite part of the game are the slopes. I'm dead serious. It's actually that simple. My second least favorite part is the camera shift. Anytime you turn around, watch as I attempt to platform across the x-axis as I panic with my left thumb on the analog stick. I shouldn't have to make the sign of the cross every time I press the button. The camera, Tim Allen's sprite, and the slopes plague the possibilities of collecting anything at all. It is beyond infuriating. Everything is stacked against the player. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Home Improvement SNES is extremely difficult. Notice how all of the footage shown so far is from the first level. I understand that a lot of this may sound melodramatic, but it gets far worse. Tim Allen controls very slippery, but toggling between holding down the run button and releasing it removes some control issues. Look, I'm all about putting in my best effort to enjoy a game. Sometimes you need to take it a little slower to have more fun, and that's absolutely fine with me. With that said, these controls obviously don't fix the level design issues that are prevalent throughout the game. In my efforts to create critiques with a neutral approach, I tried various controllers. The slippery controls of Tim when changing direction could partially be my fault after all. I am using a Steam controller for this game as I do with all of my SNES titles, and I understand that this could be because I'm using an analog stick and not a D-pad. My counter to that point is that I have no issues playing every other SNES game with the Steam controller. Now get this. Through some experimentation, I learned that this game has an exploit of sorts. Weirdly enough, Tim's airspeed can be altered by holding down the run button after jumping, while he's already in the air. I doubt this was intentionally programmed, but it, yeah, it kinda helps. Yeah, platforming is significantly easier with this exploit, but I'm taking points off. For one, a player should never need to rely on an exploit to tolerate one of the largest components of the game. And second, and tell me if this sounds familiar, IKG viewers, but a small exploit cannot fix the awful level design and enemy placement. When played with the approach of being irritatingly slow, Home Improvement SNES can be fairly tolerable, sure. However, as many YouTubers have said before, a game should not be accessible by only a single way of playing, and all game designers should know this. Anyways, if I'm excited about one aspect of the gameplay, it's the assortment of abilities the player has. Tim can use an axe to dish out damage and break down weak parts of rock. This is a useless move for combat due to the wind-up animation taking its time, and the short range doesn't help either, but I enjoy using this ability to explore rocky sections. Then there's the jackhammer. The player has to use the jackhammer to break weak points in the ground, but it's so arbitrary that it really doesn't have to exist. However, I'd be lying if I said the jackhammer was useless. For the love of all that is true, use the jackhammer to defeat these crabs. It's the only viable option the player has when dealing with those. Look at how tiny they are. Those stupid crabs are the bane of my existence. The last of the side abilities is the grapple hook, and it's actually really fun to use. And I have to say, the level design does capitalize on the tool's existence. Every stage, especially in the ancient Egypt levels due to the high counts of vertical structures, the grappling hook can be aimed both diagonally and even straight up, and swinging from it is somewhat thrilling due to the speed. And there's a surprising amount of versatility that comes with the grapple hook. Do you need to head down to a platform that is vertically below you? Well, you can hang on to an extension and take yourself down there. This is a safe way to ensure that players can't get stuck in these maze-like areas, which is worthy of some points from me. 
The level design is all over the place and very random, with vertical structures taking the player back to the beginning of the level constantly. Everything is constructed similarly to Sonic CD, for the most appropriate comparison. Nothing is laid out with any sense of purpose here, and the tool crates aren't very well hidden, nor is there really a clever way to obtain any of them. The primary weapons are all themed around the idea of tool time, the things that Tim and Al would use in the show. We have a nail gun that has great range, but accuracy worse than Kevin Monroe's adaptation of Ratchet and Clank, a chainsaw that shoots freaking lasers, and a blowtorch that is surprisingly a competitive weapon and a viable option for survival. A quick fire rate, decent range, and pretty high damage output. You guessed it, the only worthwhile weapon is the blowtorch. Now, unlike all the other tools, the primary weapons are not obtained in a traditional upgrade system. It's a pickup system. Tim Allen is supposed to collect upgrades throughout the levels, but some of these upgrades are literal downgrades. Okay, I guess the weapons lying about are meant to be swapped out, not necessarily an upgrade of what you already have. But my question is, how effective is this idea? I don't know, ask Mega Man X3. It's infuriating and bare bones for a game with a surprisingly harsh climate for combat. Okay, okay. This aspect of the game makes me furious! The enemy design. There are way too many instances where the player can just spam the attack button and win. All you have to do is place Tim at a convenient spot, and if you're extremely careful, then yeah, you're not gonna have an issue in the slightest. But for the people who don't want to awkwardly stand still holding the fire button, you'll be scrambling for bolts as you twitch the D-pad back and forth while jumping constantly in efforts of dealing with damage without receiving it yourself. Due to the aforementioned camera and control problems and the mostly useless weapons, there is little hope for the player to get out of these circumstances. The enemies bring out the worst of what is already a terribly flawed game. People, you have two options when playing Home Improvement Power Tool Pursuit. It's either stand far away and completely destroy the AI, or die. It's that drastic. Home Improvement SNES is one of the hardest games I've played, up there with Castlevania 3 and Mega Man X6 at times. Well, keywords being at times. You know what, let's just calm down and we'll take a quick look at Wikipedia and see what they say about the game's reception, okay? There's no way the critics could manage the enemy encounters. I mean, they must have something harsh to say, right? I really want to see how the game was received based on sheer difficulty alone. GamePro gave Home Improvement Power Tool Pursuit a mixed review, calling it like Pitfall with power tools. They commented that the game plays well and is easy to pick up on has solid graphics, and features mediocre music, and concluded that it would be fun for side-scrolling fans and enthusiasts of the TV show. But is not challenging enough for hardcore gamers. Are you insane? Some outlets felt similarly about the game being easy. What are you doing? Thankfully, enemies stay dead no matter where you are on the stage, unless you die, of course. I guess that really solves it all, huh? Huh? No, of course not. Back on track, every stage has a clock hidden within itself that increases the timer. So there's another saving grace, right? No. Do you people have any idea how long I played this game for? Until I mastered it and was ready to record footage? I didn't keep track, but it was definitely over 20 hours. And that's enough on the controls and gameplay. <laughs> I planned on analyzing each level's layout, or at least the general trends between the different areas, but after taking some notes, I found that there are too many trends between the entirety of the adventure for me to make everyone sit through a level-by-level -level analysis. And that wouldn't be worthwhile anyway. So, how is the level design overall again? Awful. Every once in a while, there will be a really neat and well-designed area, such as this spot right here. The player has to experiment by attacking the dinosaur while swinging and avoiding the fire blasts. Well, unless you cheat it with the fire gun, but shh. It's an interesting little set piece, and above all else, it actually works kind of well. It's fair, 
and fun. The bosses are so lame that it's not even worth talking about. It's what you'd expect, finagling a victory by painful maneuvers as the camera snaps left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, every time you turn around. Guys, I'm done. <sighs> I feel better now. Okay, okay. Presentation. I recorded this game with visual enhancements, bumping up the visual quality to HD and making sure that the footage was recorded in 60fps with VSync turned on. With that said, this game looks passable for a Super Nintendo game, with a decent amount of detail in the environments. The backgrounds have interesting atmospheres thanks to the abstract settings chosen for a home improvement video game, but the detail isn't as strong all the way in the back. However credit where it's due. I have no personal gripes with the frame rate though. The game usually stays at a solid 60 FPS but can often dip to 20 FPS or lower in brief instances, which trust me, I know how horrible that sounds. Surprisingly, the frame rate dips didn't hinder my performance. You'd think it would with how unfairly difficult this game is, but from a technical standpoint, I'm taking off a few points anyway. The music is entertaining fodder, it's the best way to put it. The composers are Dan Foliart, Jim Wallace, and Steve Melillo. Let's take a listen to a couple of pieces before I spend time making a fuss about a home improvement soundtrack. Okay, not to be a Debbie Downer once again, but that was... poor. The instrumentation for this SNES title leaves a lot to be desired. Tones and pitches feel very muted and whiny, like it's some sort of notorious Sega Genesis soundtrack. This is inexcusable for the hardware, and unfortunately the compositions are lackluster as well. The chord progressions never go anywhere substantial, and I don't think there's an emotional impression with any of the tracks besides one I'll get to in a minute. As for the quality of the title screen music, I think John Tron put it best. Also, why don't we hear the credits theme while we're at it? Wow, great job! Okay, so the first area's piece of music, the Jurassic-like area, it's actually very relaxing, but it feels a little more sinister than it should because the musical phrase ends on a flat note, a D-flat if I'm correct. It's also not a very good piece of music in my opinion. It's nothing horrible, but again, what kind of impression does it leave? Nothing, right? Well, beyond what I just said about it. This is by far the toughest decision I've had to make regarding the recommendation score. Now please keep in mind that this score should not be taken literally, the review should have spoken for itself. But just as a way to cap it all off, here we go. Cartridges of Home Improvement Power Tool Pursuit are around the $40 mark on Amazon, which is not ideal. And the availability seems to be relatively mixed depending on where you're looking. And with the game's quality, valueless. It came very close to receiving the An Abomination score, meaning no way in heck should you play this game because it's thoroughly abysmal, but I decided to give mercy to Home Improvement SNES because of the following reason. 
This game is far from being as bad as the many other games in the back of my mind. There are titles much worse and much more worthy of that an abomination rating. And also, Home Improvement Power Tool Pursuit has some qualities to it. Playing the game has no value, and thus you should not play it. However, I do really want to stress that there's some very neat things about this game. In all honesty, the sheer ridiculousness of the game never became dull throughout the frustration. Never. I mean, just think about it. Innocent Christoph Gavin sat with his controller and shot lasers from a glowing chainsaw as Tim Allen towards a T-Rex for five minutes. That sums up the hilariousness of this game. It's just too funny to hate. And even if we ignore the little positives Home Improvement has, the gameplay just isn't bad enough to get the lower score. Close, but no cigar. Absolute entertainment? You shall have mercy. Valueless. <laughs> Okay, that's all for today, ladies and gentlemen. If you'd like to find out more about my previous videos and stories behind they were made, I have a second YouTube anniversary behind the scenes video that'll be on display at the end for you to check out, and I'll be highlighting some other great videos, reviews, we'll see. Something will be there at the end. <laughs> uh, but please feel free to check those things out. Thank you for watching, everybody. This was a interesting review to make. It took so long because the game sucks. That's pretty much my answer. Well, I've been busy. I was a little lazy there too, but you know, it's home improvement for the SNES. So with that said, I will see you next time in a special review marathon about a sly protagonist. Huh? Huh? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs>